Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, take action, give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Uh, Socially Democratic is also sponsored by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you passionate about providing access to justice? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, is looking for a senior associate to join their TAC and work injuries team on a full-time permanent basis in their Dandenong and Ringwood offices. You'll use your legal technical knowledge and expertise to strive for fair outcomes for their clients. The role is obviously based in Melbourne. And to apply, go to morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that dives into the progressive issues and campaigns of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. Um, and we are going up to Sydney today. We're going to speak to the National Secretary of the Transport Workers Union of Australia, my old union. Uh, Michael Kane is going to join us to talk to us about a whole bunch of campaigns that the union is running right now, particularly across the gig economy and also the airline industry now that things are starting to open up and we're all jumping back on aeroplanes again. Um, if you uh, like the show, please let us know by leaving us a review on Apple Podcast or on Podchaser and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify and Stitcher and for all the updates, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Tuesday morning in uh, in Melbourne and joining me on the line from Sydney is the National Secretary of my old union, the Transport Workers Union of Australia. Michael Kane, welcome to Socially Democratic. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, actually, as I said to you just off, off mic before, I've been meaning to get you on the podcast for a while now and I just sort of thought I'll, I'll wait till some things sort of start to uh, percolate away in the transport industry because it is it's a reasonably as I, actually I was gonna say it's a reasonably settled industry but even my time as a union organizer I think there's plenty of times that we're at, at the front <laughs> with a gate locked on the grass um, but certainly things are happening now so I thought right now is the time to get Michael on um, and have a bit of a yak um, talk to us about broadly what's the state of the transport industry in Australia like at this moment because I get a sense from you guys that you feel like it's in a bit of, bit of crisis. Why is that? It is in a bit of a crisis but also I, I guess there's a bit of a renaissance in the community about what it means to the community. I mean what COVID has really shown us is the critical importance of transport, whether it's aviation, whether it's uh, general trucking, um, uh, whether it's uh, the new gig economy. And, I mean, of course, aviation was hit first and hardest um, when the borders had to close. Um, and we saw from that um, the most reprehensible actions uh, that, that emanated from the likes of Qantas. Um, uh, our workplace health and safety uh, delegate, at Qantas, a cleaner, um, before the borders were closed... Uh, when we had the news of the virus, um, you know, spreading itself from China, uh, decided that he would say to his work group uh, that um, they should uh, stop work until the company provided with them with personal protective equipment um, and training uh, and processes about planes that had come in from Wuhan. Um, now, not too much to ask in retrospect, you would think, um, but he had the foresight to say, well, there's dangers here that, that we're not dealing with, that the company's not appropriately dealing with, um, and he was sacked. I mean, there's a criminal uh, case on against Qantas now as a result of that from, um, uh, from the New South Wales safety regulator. But it shows us that these workers are really in the front line. Um, they're in the front line, whether they're in a truck getting stuff to the supermarket shelves, which they did so brilliantly through the pandemic. They're in the front line if they're a worker uh, suffering terrible conditions in the gig economy, but nevertheless running the virus gauntlet and delivering to businesses and families while we're in the midst of lockdown in our capital cities. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that the importance of these workers and the supply chains within which they operate 
are critical. They are the lifeline of our community. I think that's been an important part of COVID, but it's also shown how fragile uh, these arrangements are in transport, uh, why we need to make sure that terms and conditions are more robust and accountability is more robust, not just at an employer level, but right through the supply chain and particularly in respect of those who are at the top of those supply chains who hold the economic power. So, you know, COVID um, has shown to the community, I think, what we know, being in transport and having been in transport for many years, is the truth. It's fragile, it's critically important, uh, and it needs urgent action. I'll go into Qantas a little bit later on in the uh, in the show, but I, I want to start with um, uh, the Amazon dispute. We had Lawrence Ben on from the RWDSU, uh, the union over in the United States, uh, a while back talking about the um, Amazon dispute that they had in Alabama, just outside Birmingham, um, a while back. Just talk us through what's going on with Amazon here in Australia um, and how this all kicked off. Well, Amazon um, is is a be- literally a beast. Uh, I mean, it won't take uh, listeners very long to go online and Google Amazon and unions and see the type of money that is ploughed in. Um, uh, and it's there, there, there's nothing secretive about it. Um, there are publicly available pieces of audiovisual material that have Amazon going out there saying, we do not want workers to collectivise. That's, that, that's not our business model. We think it's contrary to our business model. And, of course, we all know why it's contrary to their business model because they want to squeeze um, workers and treat them, quite frankly, like um, the ends of an algorithm or the, the, the next part of the machine um, that works to deliver profit uh, into the pockets of a re- very rich individual. And in Australia, uh, we had Amazon uh, enter with much fanfare. And, of course, people have become accustomed to clicking the app, and then, you know, it's almost like magic. Um, the next day, sometimes the same day, the thing you clicked on, it's there's a knock at your door and there it is. Um, and um, often the click comes with a free delivery. Well, nothing, nothing in life is free. You know, our parents used to tell us that. Nothing in life is free. And it's not free here because the people uh, that they are engaging to perform that work, are terribly exploited. So when Amazon first came into Australia with their first warehouses a few years ago, they engaged Australia Post and told Transport to do their deliveries. But this was always going to be a stopgap measure. Um, And what they've done since is that they've created uh, their own transport operation called Amazon Flex. And Amazon Flex is um, an extension of the gig economy. It's It's an app. That anyone can download, you sign off your normal acceptances and uh, click all to, to accept here. And um, you bring your own car, you drive into four lanes in the warehouse, um, they don't check your car, they don't check your credentials other than what you've ticked off on the, on the box. They stuff your car with boxes, literally till you can't see out of your rear vision or your side mirrors, we've got the video of it, mm-hmm. and then they send you away and they pay you for a block of four hours, 108 bucks. Now, 108 bucks has got to cover your labour, it's got to cover your car, your insurances, your fuel. Of course, it doesn't do anything near that. Uh, it ends up being much less than half the minimum wage, and that's if you get the task done with all those packages in your car within the four hours allotted. So this is what um, we call um, in transport the Amazon effect, it's this creation of a substandard arrangement um, which is dragging down standards in the industry. These, these workers now and this model is pitted in competition with employers. We may have had our arguments with them over the years, but who have, who have built up with us and perhaps because of us um, reasonable terms and conditions over many, many years, mm. and they operate within a system. We may have some discussion about the adequacy of that system at times, but they operate within a system. And in that sense, they are part of the moderated, moderating forces in the system um, uh, to ensure that workers uh, get a fair shake. Amazon Flex and the gig economy deliberately operates outside of the system uh, so that those protections don't apply. They can do whatever they like. They can impose any 
um, uh, um, term and condition on those workers that they want, and those workers either take it or leave it. It's like the modern hungry mile. Um, people are literally dying because of it, uh, and it's destroying um, good employers in the process, and that's the Amazon effect. You know, it's interesting you bring that point up now. That just reminds me back to um, my early days as a union organiser with the TWU and the focus certainly with all those major logistic companies was those heads of agreement. Let's just lock in some um, some wage growth for our members. Don't touch the conditions or try to improve them where we can. So then we can then go and focus on some of those smaller, you know, cowboy companies as we spoke about. Um, I hadn't even considered then that the, the fact that this major global multinational company can come in and actually behave like a cowboy as well. Um, what impact has that had on uh, the union and its ability to to both um, continue to organise with these major logistic companies? Like, what are they doing? Are they looking across at Amazon and saying, well, we need to be like them as well? Or what's happening there? Yeah, well, it's, it, 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 is, it is the case that um, these companies are tempted um, and would, no doubt, without um, uh, our intervention... Um, go down the same road, and we've got evidence of that now out of our last uh, wages round. People may have noticed the transport strikes that have, that have occurred. They haven't occurred for a number of years because we've uh, been able to work essentially with the companies. There's been some agitation, but we've been able to work with them uh, to move standards progressively in the industry, um, wages, terms and conditions, job security, superannuation... Um, but this is a game changer because the Amazon effect and the gig economy it doesn't contemplate employers at all. So it, it puts workers outside of um, the employment relationship and the protections um, uh, that that um, provides. But if you take one step back, uh, what is clear is that it doesn't contemplate employers. It, it is it is a... a the use of new technology to give out what is work that's been done from time immemorial, that is transporting something from A to B, but getting rid of the middle man. Uh, uh, and that is um, something that employers now are absolutely petrified about um, because, of course, that is who they are. So you have massive transport companies that have built up footprints over the years, some of them good, with good union footprints like UPS in the States, some of them with hideous anti-union, union-busting footprints like FedEx. Um, nevertheless, they are employers and they exist within a system. The gig economy bypasses them completely. So they are petrified about it and they should be. And the thing is that they are the, they, they, these big companies are the natural constituency of conservative political forces. Mm conservative governments, such as our own coalition government in Australia. And what these governments have not yet clicked onto is to is that their greatest supporting base is being cannibalised by their failure to act to regulate and bring within the system these massive uh, corporate cowboys, as you call them, these Amazon, these gig, econ these gig economy companies, bring them back into the system so that they're playing on the same uh, field uh, as employers who, while we might not agree with their every move, are compelled to um, uh, compete within that framework that has some protections within it. So we've got a big structural change here that governments are failing to um, respond to in an adequate way. If governments really wanted to support business, then they would be supporting their core business constituency by making sure that these companies cannot operate outside the system. Uh, and, of course, if you're, if you're a Labor government or a centre democratic government, um, it, you would see that you have to do that both to support business but also to make sure that workers are not exploited. It's time for governments to really pull up their socks here, to wake up to the fact that the economy has moved beyond them uh, we've got laws that are completely old-fashioned and out of date, and we've got industrial systems built around um, an archaic, some would say arcane construct now of the employment relationship solely. We've got to get beyond that, and we've got to figure out a pathway through it. 
I'm interested in your thoughts on that. What is the solution with respect to that? I mean, I think that wasn't the, the attraction for people that entered into the gig economy initially was that it was giving you the, the, the freedom to do pick up work when you wanted to. But now it appears that um, that 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 um, that honeymoon period is kind of over because I don't think folks are, are enjoying those freedoms. And in fact, they're noticing that this relationship is imbalanced and they're being taken advantage of. Um, what what what? If you're looking at legislative change from governments um, and updates to industrial laws, what does the TW want to see here? You know, it's a, it's a great question. I think we just need to take one step back to really uh, to really attack it, and that is to deal with that mythology of flexibility that was built up by these um, by these gig companies. Um, this notion that um, you could only have flexible work arrangements if workers were outside of the current system. That's not actually true, um, for starters. Uh, first, first of all, there are lots of um, arrangements that are highly flexible uh, within the employee um, framework. Uh, we've done them for years, as you know, Steve, within um, road transport. We've had um, arrangements whereby people can have a safety net um, but can then have kind of incentive rates that work on, on top of that mm. so that they're always getting a better outcome but but never go below um, the minima. Um, there are arrangements in the courier industry where you can have kind of ad hoc type um, work but still have a safety net underpinning that. So it's a notion that you can't have flexibility um, uh, and protections at the same time. Of course, it's a very convenient one for these companies um, and a very powerful one because it, it really appeals to that sense of um, entrepreneurship that, has probably always existed in humans, but um, in you know in our in our in our society, um, in our capitalist society, it really taps into those people um, uh, and says to them, "Oh yeah, um, you know that thing that that Morrison atrocity. If I if I have a go, I'll, I'll get a go." Yeah. Um, it it kind of taps into that. But of course, if you have a go, you could end up dying. You could end up mm. dying in the gig economy. That's what's actually occurred, and that's what occurred to. Uh, in respect of um, a number of workers in 2020, Ik Wong, Biju Paul, Xiao Zhu Chen, Didi Freddy, Chao Kai Shen, Barat Dogen, they were all dead. They are workers who were working as ride share, as, um, as food delivery riders, they were just going about their business. Some of them were overseas students, some of them were locals, and they're dead. They're dead because they were pressed and pushed it wasn't about flexibility. It was about we will pay you what we want to pay you. We will tell you to work when we want you to work. We will impose um, uh, work conditions that are impossible to comply with in terms of timing. And if you don't comply with them, we have the right to boot you off the app um, uh, by email, by an algorithm. I mean, that is not flexibility. It's the opposite of flexibility. Uh, and I think we're getting to the point across the world and in Australia where that myth is finally being busted. The question is, um, how do we deal with the fact that the community has become accustomed to this type of convenience? And indeed, the notion, as I said earlier, of, of people having food delivered in, uh, to them while in lockdown, well, that's for those people who are having the deliveries come to them, that's, that's an important health function that these workers um, have have performed, um, but just more generally, it's it's part of our community now. We we hail an Uber. We 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 order our food uh, online. What does it mean about those workers? Uh, well, we have to change our view as um, collective organisations of labour as well. Um, we cannot continue to just think that the only solution here is the employment relationship, which is hundreds of years old uh, and is now afflicted by um, a common law that's been built up through the courts over years, um, which means you've got a very narrow uh, avenue to navigate to actually get justice for workers. And the outcome of a case that you run for these workers has two significant flaws. First of all, it's an individual case that can apply in only that circumstance and has no flow-on effect. And secondly, um, the, 
the key thing here is that um, we need a system uh, that acknowledges that work is on a spectrum. Work has always been on a spectrum. These cases, if you win them, workers get everything. If you lose them, workers get nothing, even if they fall just on the independent contractor side of that employee-independent contractor divide. Now, that can't be right. What is much more logical is that um, if you fall just on the independent contractor side of the employee line, then you should get just about as many protections as employees get. If you fall somewhat distant to that line, then you might get none or only some of those protections because we've got to come to grips with the fact that work occurs on a spectrum of dependency. At the very dependent end, that's what we call employees, and we built up a system. No need to disturb that. If you're completely dependent, you're an employee, bang, there's your system. But there's this whole other part of the spectrum that these companies have learnt to access They know where the dividing line is. There's the dividing line. We structure ourselves the other side of it. So we've got to make sure that we figure out as a community how we properly regulate the rest of that spectrum. We need to be empowering a body that has the ongoing and standing capacity to inquire into these forms of work and assign rights, obligations and protections that are attuned to the level of dependency that that worker has on those that engage them. It's not rocket science. It just requires governments to take a different view. And if they do that, they'll be supporting workers. They'll be supporting the traditional businesses that are are bound by the um, employee obligations. And they'll be supporting... They'll actually be supporting the emerging businesses because they will be saying to them, You don't have to run the gauntlet of maybe winning or losing an employee independent contract case anymore. That's a a great source of business uncertainty. We're going to make this very certain for you. You reach an agreement with the workforce, and we say that means with unions. You sign that agreement, you bring it to the tribunal, they give it a stand. If you don't do that, the tribunal can come in and it can impose appropriate obligations, and that's how it should be. And if we're going to get change that properly supports workers and business that's the type of model we're going to have to put in place. I've noticed that the union has had some successes um, in this space um, over the last 12 months. Is, has that success come from taking these companies to through the court system or is it through the arbitration system? Where have you, what, what has been your legal strategy to represent these individuals? And I know that it's not, obviously not applying more widespread and that's frustrating, but where have you had success so far? Well, we've taken the view that we have to identify um, strategic cases to action, first of all, because at the moment we only have the blunt instrument of that, are you an employee or are you not? So we've decided um, we have to take a number of those cases. Now, um, over the past three or four years, um, we've had a couple of significant victories, um, a couple of losses and a couple of in-betweens. And that's important because it says to the community that this is not settled, that we need to do something here. So in the case of Fedora, which was in the in Australian cities from around about 2012 to 2017. Uh, we ran a case for uh, a writer called Joshua Kluger, uh, uh, an unfair dismissal case. He was knocked off the app. Um, we ran an unfair dismissal case. Of course, the threshold question can only run an unfair dismissal case for an employee. Um, so the, the commission had to run a threshold case about whether Joshua was an employee. The commission found he was an employee And um, Fedora's response to that was to abandon the country, literally. They pulled up stumps and left. Now, we don't actually think that's the answer. It's their decision, fine. But we don't actually think that's the answer, uh, of course. We think that systemic change in the the way I've just suggested is is the answer. But we've only got these blunt cases to take. Mm. We took another case recently, Diego Franco, Deliveroo Rider. Again, we won that case, Um, an employee. They're appealing that case. We took a case for some uh, Uber Eats drivers performing work in their car, the Guptas. They ran the case at first instance in the Fair Work Commission. They lost. We ran an appeal. We lost the appeal, but in the course of making their decision, the Fair Work Commission started to unpick the fiction of Uber's contractual arrangements. Uber, up until that point, had uh, uh, asserted 
that they had no relationship with riders or drivers of their food at all. Uh, they were merely a, a, a passive agent connecting restaurants uh, with drivers and they, it, they, they couldn't be on the hook for any responsibility because they weren't involved. Now, while we lost the case in the Fair Work Commission about whether uh, Amita Gupta was an employee, the Fair Work Commission said to Uber, this is a fiction, you have a direct contract with this worker. Uh, and um, as a result of that, Uber Eats across the world has now changed its contractual arrangements, not where we need them to be, mm. but at least getting rid of one layer of fiction. And in an important coda to that Gupta case, uh, we appealed it to the federal court and the full bench of the federal court heard the case over, over a day. And the transcript of that case shows the federal court judges being highly sceptical of the structures and the approach that Uber Eats was taking to workers to the extent that Uber Eats settled that case, a case that if we'd won would have provided compensation uh, as a maximum to the Guptas of around about $15,000. They settled that case for $400,000. So this is an indication about how uh, what these companies will do to protect their exploitative business models, um, and we're going to keep taking these strategic cases. There's another category of approach we've been taking, and that is an old organising approach. Um, so in the case of Hungry Panda, uh, a a food delivery uh, company f focused on the Chinese community uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, uh, workers uh, put up their hands to say that they were unhappy with their rates. They got fired. Um, we put unfair dismissal cases in the in the tribunal, um, but but we didn't have to run them because um, seventy five. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but believe me, in the gig economy, um, in circumstances where we don't really have a place to represent them yet. Um, 75 of those workers uh, signed up to the union, it's still there, uh, and they demanded that the company reinstate these workers and enter a dialogue to make terms and conditions better. And um, that's exactly what occurred. Uh, they were reinstated, they got full compensation, and we're now in com uh, conversation uh, with Hungry Panda. Similarly, um, we've had some success uh, in terms of um, negotiating arrangements uh, with Menulog, and Menulog has um, reached uh, out to us after initial conversations and said that they are interested in pursuing an employee model um, in Australia. Um, there's some, some real technical difficulties uh, about that and market difficulties, but, but it is a good sign and, and there's some conversations occurring there. So the, the dial is starting to move. Um, uh, it's glacial. It will be given great support by a government that decided that uh, it should act properly in this area and perhaps we will get there at some point, either with this coalition government or if there's a change of government uh, in the election. Of course, um, there's some opportunities there as well. In the meantime, we have to use the blunt instruments, we have to do our old-fashioned organising and we have to try and engage as partners those other businesses that are suffering because of the um, standards-down uh, pull approach um, that the gig economy is is um, is challenging them with. Election, uh, the federal election is um, can be called at any moment now, and that presents some leverage certainly for the union in terms of getting some outcomes uh, legislatively in terms of addre addressing some of the things you just clearly outlined. Um, what has been? Have you been in dialogue with the coalition government? What's their appetite for creating change? Uh, to address this stuff and or also a potential Albanese government? Yeah, well, look, we've been in, in touch with both. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, before he was quite appropriately sidelined, um, uh, Christian Porter had uh, a number of conversations with the union and workers uh, in the gig economy. Uh, and he seemed to acknowledge um, the link between working conditions and safety outcomes uh, and he also seemed to acknowledge the notion um, of the or the uh, the way we were articulating work on a spectrum, and that um, and that the gig economy essentially is the crystallisation of an awareness that the current system is not 
um, suitable anymore, by itself at least. Uh, and we were in conversation with um, uh, with Christian Porter, who was, who was also the Minister for um, Industrial Relations, um, as well as the Attorney General, um, uh, over a period of months about that. Um, it's been less fruitful uh, since Senator Cash uh, took the position, but she has uh, also had a meeting with unions and the worker the workers um, so that this could be set out for her. We're waiting for um, her response uh, to that. Um, it, it is true to say, I think, that um, uh, Senator Cash's history uh, on industrial relations and moving in that area is um, underwhelming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, But... Uh, in fairness, she has taken that meeting and she has said that she's considering what's being put. Um, of course, we've also spoken with uh, the Labor Party and crossbenchers uh, about this because the entire parliament has to move um, uh, to get um, the appropriate changes that we need. Um, and the Albanese opposition has already made uh, public announcements about legislating to ensure that um, gig workers are provided with appropriate protections and of course uh, we um, we will continue uh, our advocacy to ensure that 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 um, if they win government uh, means a system that can properly um, regulate the spectrum of work um, so that we can um, ensure that these companies are operating within the system and not outside of it um, but still um, providing and maintaining uh, the convenience that people have become accustomed to with this new way of giving out work. How do you organise workers in the gig economy? Because that's something that would fascinate me and I'm somewhat glad that I'm not a TW organiser these days because I think that would be a bit of a challenge. I remember trying to organise the guys uh, that were like the toll riders, but at least they had a depot that they were based out of so you could catch them there. Like this, uh, I'm assuming that people that work in the gig economy, whether they be Uber drivers or if they're um, you know, delivery riders, they have no base, they have no office, they have no starting point. They're just literally hanging out the front of... Um, uh, restaurants waiting to pick up their stuff and then they're on the road. How are your organisers engaging with these workers, building relationships with them, establishing leadership and then developing an organising structure there? What's what's been successful for you guys so far? Yeah, well, it is is very difficult. But um, one of the things we draw strength from is that we were organising gig workers um, before there was mechanisation. The the trolley and drayman... um, uh, the horse and cart uh, people um, in the 1850s and 60s in the first iterations of the unions in the colonies, um, they were, in effect, independent contractors and they used to come to to, um, to points of gathering where they would, in a sense, vie for work on any given day. So they're like the original, you know, I don't know if they were the original gig workers. I'm sure they existed in, that, in other sectors of our economy as well. But they were gig workers. You know, they would come with their horse and cart and they'd try and get a bit of work for the day. Uh, and, in fact, our union started in each of the colonies separately uh, in, well, at least in South Australia, Queensland, uh, Victoria and New South Wales, um, by, uh, with these trolling drones. They, they were, in a sense, independent contractors and they came together um, and the, they were the kind of um, uh, the seeds of um, the union as it emerged um, uh, into the 20th century. And, um, and, and, and that means that we're not afraid of, um, and we've had some success in organising uh, workers who um, are not necessarily in one place, could be at different points, um, consider themselves to be entrepreneurs or business people um, as well. Uh, and we've embraced that. So um, uh, the unions represented um, independent contractors for over 100 years. It's got structures in place uh, in three states that support um, legislatively um, the representation of uh, owner driver uh, owner drivers, uh, people who um, who have their own small business, uh, operate their own vehicle, sometimes a small vehicle, sometimes a large rig, uh, and. And so that gives us a model of confidence about the fact that this is to be done, about um, uh, also about mentality, that is that we understand that there are people who want to be um, contributing to Australian working life through the prism of a small business. 
there's that entrepreneurship uh, element that's in them and they want to do that uh, and we should find ways to support that and we have. And then the question of organising, how do we organise them? Well, the best, clearly, it always helps if you have um, a legislative framework that supports um, uh, the development and maintenance and enhancement of terms and conditions because there's a little bit of a rallying cry. The challenge of the gig economy at the moment is, of course, that that, that doesn't exist. And um, what you're really relying on is um, people to come together um, uh, because of dissatisfaction or because of the danger they feel. And that's not, not, that hasn't been without um, success either but it is a hard slog. One of the things that we've, um, we've, um, we've managed to organise around, as I just said, the Hungry Panda um, uh, example it is an industrial example, but also we've used workplace health and safety laws. Uh, so for the first time ever, uh, as we understand it, uh, other than those, some European jurisdictions that have deemed workers to be employees, um, for the first time outside of one of those jurisdictions, we succeeded in... Um, creating uh, workplace health and safety work groups at Deliveroo in Sydney. Uh, and this was, um, this was a real breakthrough. It had worker activists that had come together um, uh, a few years ago. They formed the Delivery Riders Alliance and then they quickly joined with us. Um, and a number of those workers in the Deliveroo operation said, we, this is ridiculous, we need a voice to be able to make sure that um, we're not, these, these runs that we do are not just extended by two Ks, mm. as they have been, that the, the rates we're given are not just unilaterally reduced um, because that's an effect on our safety. We have to race to a job to, to get paid then we're endangering ourselves in the community. Um, and they held, they held strong and they managed to form work, um, work groups. And that means that they now forced the company to the table to talk about terms and conditions. And I can't say that that's led to a flood of members uh, coming into the TWU, that's not the case. But it's certainly providing us with a, a base in these companies um, uh, and not just Deliveroo because um, now that we've cracked the model, other companies know that we can do the same and they are less um, resistant to speaking with us about it because they know they're just going to go through that fight. Mm. So it's these types of structures and it's a, it's a it's an incre um, incremental iterative process. Yeah, you 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 start with a you start with an issue as you always do. Uh, you build around that issue. You build some structures. Then you use those structures to build and build and build. It's painstaking. It's glacial. We need um, a, a structural reform uh, to really make a difference. Um, but we are there, and people are coming into the union. The, um, the RWDSU's uh, campaign in Amazon, um, I, I was just interested to get a sense from you. I know that you, the TW are representing the drivers that are going in and out of the Amazon depots and obviously the workers in the Amazon depot would probably be covered, well, potentially could be covered by the TW or maybe the SDA or the NUW. Um, looking at the, the, the campaign that they ran over there, are there parallels between the dispute that they had in the United States or are there any key learnings that you've taken from the way that that, that union sought to leverage a wider community support beyond just their union? Is the uh, TW working with other like-minded unions uh, to try and crack this Amazon challenge that is now presented to, to workers in, in Australia? Yeah, and it really is important. It really is about that community awareness because um, at the moment in Australia, I still think we're at the point where the community um, loves the conveniences and is not really thinking about um, the other portions of it. Um, and some of those uh, stories, of course, um, of within a warehouse are so disturbing. Uh, I mean, the, the level of surveillance is like something from a, um, a dystopian um, movie set. You know, where people literally have sirens going off if they get, you know, within um, a certain meterage. I can't remember what it is, but it's four meters or something of another of another human. Um, you know, there's there's sirens that go off and they do it repeatedly, and there's a warning. And there's a reason for that. They don't want people talking to each other. Um, it's as simple as that. They don't want any capacity to collectivize, and that's what um, uh, that Alabama fight was all about. It was very inspiring. I mean, of course really difficult to get the vote up in the face of um, uh, the approach that uh, the company takes to the, the, 
sheer deluge of meetings and mm. brainwashing and that goes on, but not only that, you know, the threats. These are people that um, are not getting very much at Amazon, but they're still getting something and need it to actually get to the next day. So it, it's that it's that working poor, it's that enslaved poor that really they just want to continue to perpetuate. Um, uh, the good thing about Alabama, and, and I've, 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 it's awful, but I've forgotten the the, the next um, part of the fight has been joined. I've just forgotten where that is now in the states. But um, uh, is that it did it did excite it excited um, uh, the community and the base this notion that uh, we we actually can stand up here and make a difference. We're working with the SDA at the moment in the alliance um, to um, to do just that in Amazon. Uh, it's been focused around the Sydney um, uh, arrangement uh, out of Moorbank. And um, and now that we've got this um, these stories coming out but from both within the warehouse and through the Amazon Flex um, uh, prison, uh, there's there's a real opportunity for us to make some headway. The Amazon Flex arrangement is important for us because it's um, it's notionally covered in New South Wales by some owner driver laws that have existed here, CW owner driver laws that have existed here for some years, uh, and of course we're um, we're in the process of actioning those so that we may have, um, before too long, the first pot of Amazon workers that are captured within the union arrangement, there being these Amazon Flex um, uh, workers. Um, so there's work being done there. Yes, the community message um, is so critical. And uh, I'd argue, Steve, that, um, that if you're going to take Amazon on, not only can't you do it as a single union, um, you, you have to have community... Um, organisations with you. You have to have the international union movement uh, with you as well, and not just one global union federation, but right across a whole range of global union federations um, to be able to to be able to do that. And I think um, that is starting to emerge. That kind of uh, understanding that um, we're going to need a, a, a unanimity of um, purpose and strategy to be able to take this on. One of the ways we've dealt with it um, internationally is very recently um, we managed to achieve uh, at the ILO um, uh, a set of um, guidelines which we're hoping in the next five years or so will become treaty obligations um, for decent and safe work in road transport. And this is the road transport element of it. Uh, and the important breakthrough in that document was that for the first time we started to speak about the economic employer. Um, those at the top of supply chain were the head of contract networks. And we started to talk about non-standard form of works, not work, not just the employment relationship. So this notion of spectrum that we've been speaking about. So, um, so th we are starting to get um, this uh, approach uh, that says that we have to deal with this across the board. Of course, lots of jurisdictions... Um, particularly in Europe, are dealing with this by saying these people, they walk like um, employees, they look like employees, they are employees, so we're going to call them employees. Um, that's one one way to do it, um, and I wouldn't discourage any government from taking that approach. Uh, but another approach is to say, well, this type of um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, atmosphere is going to continue in our community, so we're better off figuring out how we tap into that um, uh, and encourage it within a framework that provides proper protection. So that, that, that's the approach we're taking at the moment. I want to ask you a quick question on Star Trek and then we might jump into the air, airline industry um, just to wrap it up. But I uh, was watching the news the other morning and uh, there was the, uh, the Star Trek uh, depot warehouse in Adelaide, which um, I'd spent a number of mornings there before the belt started up. Far too early for me. I am not a morning person. One wonders <laughs> why I wanted to be an organiser of the TWU. But anyway, um, and uh, and they were in a dispute. Um, now I know it's been a while since I was there, but reasonably good relationship between the the unions members and Star Trek. Um, what brought on this uh, industrial dispute with uh, with Star Trek? Well, look, it was within the context, first of all, of um, a major bargaining round. Um, uh, we, um, as a union, we made a decision around about 10 years ago that um, the, the, the system we were working within was flawed. This notion of enterprise um, bargaining was really dangerous for us because it splintered our strength um, and it provided really those at the top of the supply chain, those customers at the top of the supply chain, 
um, with all of the power. We really just handed our power to them because if they didn't like the terms and conditions that their transport company was providing them, they'd just go round to terms of condition round them to terms of conditions that were lower or substandard. Um, and yes, we we've always wanted to make legislative change to um, to deal with that, but there's no point whinging about it while you can't. Um, so we made the call that we were going to try and line up as many expiry dates in our agreements as we could and try and exercise mass industrial strength. Not rocket science, but actually a bit harder to do um, uh, practically than just saying. Um, so we did. We lined up um, around about 247 of our um, biggest road transport agreements and we um, uh, primed them up for a big industry hit in June 2020. Of course, COVID had other ideas about that. So um, our big industry hit uh, couldn't occur. But what we did is we slid the um, uh, expiry dates of the major transport operators down the road by a year. And that's why you've seen all this activity around 2021. We had not intended to focus on the major transport operators. Um, we'd intended actually to, to, to focus on the B-grade operators and try and lift them up to the standards we'd achieved at those bigger operations. But these big transport companies made the decision for us because they, and this goes back to the question you asked right at the outset, uh, they hit us up with counterclaims essentially, which wanted to insert B rates to compete with the gig economy and expressly with other likes of Amazon Flex. So uh, we ended up having to fight a really significant round. Um, and of course, with these expiry dates um, uh, lined up, uh, we took basically industry action across all of the major transport operators. Six of the major transport operators settled as a result of strike action and negotiations, and that's good. And they settled on good, strong bases with, with good increases and good job security and abandoning those B rates. Star Trek and FedEx are the outliers. Now, Star Trek, you're right, we did have a good uh, relationship with Star Trek when it was a private company that had been built up between um, constructive management and the union over the period of the late 80s, early 90s, early 2000s. Then was taken by Australia Post and under the coalition government, it's become essentially an arm of ideology. Uh, and unfortunately, what we're faced with is a company's management team who's crimped um, by the communications minister and the edicts which he brings down uh, about this. Uh, and that is an issue. It's not insurmountable. We will get there with Star Trek. Um, it's taken a couple of national strikes already. It might take some more, but we will get there. Um, and then, of course, we've got FedEx, and FedEx is one of the most, uh, if not the most, anti-union um, uh, transport company in the world. Um, renowned for its union busting tactics and its uh, its obsession to avoid uh, workers exercising collective force, uh, and of course they're the other outliers. So you can see those companies that that said, okay, we'll have a crack, but yeah, we can see the light. We know that we have to actually be with the TWU and reform the system. They're settled, they're done, and they've given us written commitments. They'll come with us on that reform journey. The outliers are the ones that are infected uh, by ideology, either from US uh, anti-union ideology or this federal government, and that's where Star Trek sits. I did not know that, uh, and that makes a lot of sense now. That's quite interesting. Um, last couple of questions. Let's turn to the uh, airline industry. And obviously with um, I mean, most of Australia now reaching the, 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 the vaccination uh, levels that would enable us to start to move more freely both internally across all of our borders but also internationally, that means air travel will pick up. Um, what are the issues that are at the forefront of the minds of the union and its members um, as air in, as the air industry starts to uh, return to a sort of a pre-COVID kind of level? I'm, I'm assuming that obviously the health and safety of the workers is critical, particularly the you know the people that are f facing um, 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 uh, passengers, but as well as obviously the union covers catering and ramp and a whole bunch of other areas. Just talk us through what, what what's your focus going to be over the next 12 months? Yeah, well, the focus is on the rebuild, but the rebuild um, also includes um, a reset, I think, of how we approach aviation uh, as a community and politically. 
um, because what the um, pandemic has shown us is that we've, as a country, had no plan uh, for aviation. Uh, it, it, the last 18 months has been the, clearly the worst in aviation's history. Um, everything's been shut down. We've planes in the desert um, and we've had workers um, on literally on the scrap heap. Um, uh, but um, while no one could have foreseen COVID-19, they could have foreseen the type of black swan event that COVID-19 is. Uh, why? Because we've had them before. We had it with SARS. We had it with, with, with volcanoes shutting down much of the world. We've had it after 9-11 and the terrorist attacks. In other words, one thing you can be certain about in aviation is that at some point there's going to be a black swan event that affects aviation to an appreciable extent, to a disturbing extent. Now, what happens is that when we're in the upswing out of these events, uh, companies want to take and, and, and infrastructure owners want to take the benefit and the profits, like Alan Joyce, don't touch us. Don't, you stay away from us. We're a private company now. We're going to, it will deal with, uh, with all of this. Um, and of course, when an event like this happens, or there's some financial crisis uh, in the community, Alan Joyce, I'm using him as an example. Alan Joyce is walking the hallways of federal parliament with his hat out asking for a handout. So it's the classic case of privatising the profits and socialising the losses. It's the peak and trough in aviation and that's seen, um, uh, that where that's seen um, uh, most, uh, it, it's most evident that it is anywhere, we think. And what we need is we need some greater... Um, involvement of the community, of the public purse in aviation. Many countries have used COVID to reset the extent to which the public is involved in aviation right around the world. So a range of countries have done it and it's not confined to one particular um, continent. Uh, and that's the right thing to do because when this stuff occurs, you've got to be able to jump in. You've got to be able to jump in and act in the community's interest, not have private boards and executives acting in their commercial interests, which are not often, let alone necessarily, in the community's interests. And, of course, what we've seen with, with Qantas is atrocious. What we saw before that with Virgin from the federal government was atrocious. Rather than stepping in, Funding what they needed, which was two hundred million, which is a drop in the bucket compared to what they've had to spend in this pandemic, which would have seen um, Virgin take a slower trajectory to recovery, but would nevertheless have seen that recover and would have had um, public money and public accountability uh, back in that company. Instead, we had this song and dance. TW um, uh, is relieved and put a lot of effort into making sure there was ultimately a buyer and that Virgin is is back in the game, but it was touch and go for so many months. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got Qantas saying um, uh, using the pandemic effectively as an opportunity uh, to become um, uh, a holder of aircraft and a labour hire company, mm. uh, which absolves, uh, absolves itself of any responsibility uh, for workers' interests. So what we have um, through the aviation crisis um, is 89% of jobs in aviation being affected. Um, uh, we've got 43% um, uh, of them having uh, to leave the industry after the first year of the pandemic to seek other work. Th this, these workers are not coming back. Mm. These, are skills, you know, these are skills that are gone. If you're a baggage handler, that is a skilled job. If you're a ramp worker, getting the, making sure that you've got the weight distributed properly, making sure that you're appropriately, appropriately dealing with the aircraft and not puncturing it, um, uh, you know, with your baggage um, ramps in the way that these outsourced companies have done since Qantas took its illegal action is really important. Mm -hmm. So we think we're going to, we need um, a regulatory intervention here. We think governments should take equity stakes in companies. We think that um, uh, that's going to provide the ballast for the next shock 
and provide the community input into how we deal with this. But we need a plan. We need a plan for sustainable aviation, for sustainable jobs, not to the lowest common denominator. Um, I could speak about that um, for a long time, Steve. I'm not going to. But people know. Qantas have been pinged. The federal court has said they elected, acted illegally in contracting out 2,000 workers. And what has the federal government said about that? Nothing. So we've got work to do as a community um, to get aviation back on track. We should take direct interests in aviation. We need to build good jobs back. They used to be the envy of the uh, economy, a good aviation job for life. And now um, they've just become labour hire um, arrangements where people are on the minimum wage uh, and they're exploited and their safety um, is questionable. So uh, we've got work to do. Um, put it this way, the only literally for those workers, the only way is up in aviation. <laughs> Very good. Um, the, the last uh, thought, I guess, is that, and I want to get your thoughts on this, there was an article in the New York Times that was published um, uh, maybe uh, sort of halfway through the pandemic, but the whole pandemic is now starting to become a blur, so I don't know what it was, but it was talking about the aviation, aviation industry in the United States, and I think it's true in Australia as well. They were basically saying that the amount of times that the government has bailed out the aviation industry and that that the way that they've run their their businesses um, demonstrates to to everyone that they know that they are, you know, that too big to fail kind of uh, fr- frame that we hear that we can do whatever we like because in the end people still need p- people will lose their shit if they can't fly from melbourne to sydney like no one's going to catch the train no one's going to drive you need planes it's something that we just can't if if it goes over if, if it if the aviation industry falls over uh government's just not gonna let that happen yeah. and that's the leverage that they've got and so they can do whatever the hell they like and in the end the government's going to bail them out which i thought was interesting to see how the government reacted to virgin as opposed to Qantas. I don't know what you read from that. Well, um, you know, the, I may not be Mr Popular for raising this, but I'm going to raise it anyway. Um, uh, Qantas has its tentacles everywhere, and its tentacles include things like the Chairman's Lounge. Now, the Chairman's Lounge, for those who don't know, is an exclusive kind of above first-class place where selected, and I mean selected, chosen people by Alan Joyce go and have an inv- by invitation only and they get the kind of um, above first class treatment for for pre-flight, post-flight, during flight, all of that stuff. This is just, in a sense, an example of what is happening here. Um, we've got um, uh, uh, journos, politicians, those who are having to make the call on um, aviation regulation, um, who um, they're only human. I mean, it's nice to be pampered. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Um, but but I use that as an example. I'm not suggesting any particular es- uh, point of corruption here. I'm just saying that that kind of atmosphere is what pervades this. You've got Qantas seemingly untouchable, particularly under this CEO. You've got this CEO who stood out in front of the Prime Minister basically announcing health policy during the pandemic on more than one occasion. Mm. This is the guy who said at the start of the pandemic that the risk of transmission of this virus was negligible. He used those words. So there's there's an issue here about the inequality of treatment. Virgin was left to fend for itself and the Prime Minister gives press conferences with Alan Joyce and when workers are illegally outsourced, says nothing about it. So there is an inequality here. And your point about um, uh, being too big to fail is right. And that that point in and of itself makes the case for a more systemic um, presence of public money and public regulatory influence in aviation. Um, They can't have it both ways, and at the moment um, they are. Michael, I assume it's uh, been a long time since you got a compli- up, complimentary upgrade from uh, economy to business <laughs> on a, on a Qantas flight. 
I, I don't think that's ever coming. And and uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not I'm not holding my breath and um, I'm not holding my breath for the invitation to the chairman's lounge. And if it came, I would send it back with relish. Yeah. Well, thanks for dragging me down with you because I was got to do an overseas flight later in the year. And that's clearly I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get that comp either. Anyway, Michael <laughs> Kane, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really do appreciate your time. Um, best Thanks, of luck with a lot of the campaigns um, the the union is running, um, and I uh, would love to have you back on in, uh, in the near future to find out how you're progressing. Certainly in the uh, in the gig economy stuff. Cheers, mate. And thanks for the cast. It's really great. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. Music